Um, I am excited to jump in to introduce um, our um, distinguished speaker, um, Dr. Anna Lau. Um, Dr. Lau is a clinical psychologist and professor of psychology at the University of California, um, Los Angeles. She received her PhD in clinical psychology from UCLA in 2000, where she worked as a graduate student in the National Research Center on Asian American Mental Health with Dr. Stanley Su. After postdoctoral training at the Child and Adolescent Services Research Center um, at Rady's Children's Hospital in San Diego, she returned to UCLA as a faculty member in 2003. Her current research spans across the areas of disparities in children, children's mental health services, cultural variation in risk and protective factors for child psychopathology, and community implementation of evidence-based practices for ethnic minority youth and families. Dr. Lau's work on risk and protective factors for youth and Asian American immigrant families is informing efforts to implement school-based interventions for adolescents at risk of depression and suicide. Very, very important work. Um, Dr. Lau's ongoing, ongoing research is supported by the National Institute of Mental Health. Dr. Lau also trains doctoral students in the use of evidence-based practices for youth and teaches graduate and undergraduate courses related to Asian American mental health and the psychology of diversity. Dr. Lau is a fellow of the Asian American Psychological Association and received their Distinguished Contributions to Research Award. And she is currently the president-elect of the Society for Clinical Child and Adolescent Psychology. Please join me in a very warm welcome um, for Dr. Lau. Thank you for being here today. Thank you so much for the lovely introduction. I am so sorry that I'm late. Um, but I'm happy that my Wi-Fi is cooperating now. Um, if it's okay, I'll just go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Yeah, all yours. Thank you. Um, there we go. Presenter view. Okay, does that, can everyone see that all right? Um, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks again for the um, in invitation to present. I just want to make sure that I'm inviting folks to interact during the presentation. Please feel free to unmute and ask a question or um, pop something in the chat. I'll make sure that I open up my chat window so I can see if any questions are coming in, but also Barbara um, or Samantha, if you see a question come in, please feel free to, to stop me. Um, okay, so uh, I am really excited to talk to you about a range of research today, um, but kind of the first thing I wanna do is just to acknowledge that the moment that we're in um, for our AAPI communities um, and the youth and families who are really dealing with a very difficult moment um, of rising anti-Asian um, hate and violence. And I just wanna alert you all to um, a, a report of the Stop AAPI um, Health um, Campaign, a report that was developed specifically on um, incidents of hate uh, directed at youth and some recommendations um, that this group of scholars led by um, Dr. Jung um, uh, commissioned. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I'll just um, say about uh, the five recommendations in this report, obviously there are many that are really trying to reduce overall levels of exposure to this anti-Asian um, hate and violence toward youth that absolutely have um, important mental health um, consequences. I won't really be talking about racialized violence or um, racist, ra racial discrimination in this talk, but I certainly will be talking about um, how we can think about planning culturally sustaining and responsive um, mental health services for youth. So I just wanted to situate um, our talk today in, in this context. Um, I will be talking about um, unmet mental health needs in Asian American youth, um, and we'll look at some research on, re on mental health service disparities and what are some factors that might explain those disparities. Um, and then I'll spend, I hope, um, at least half our time talking about treatments that we know work for Asian American youth and how we might go about using translational research to inform our selection of evidence-based interventions for this population. 
um, and looking at some effectiveness data um, from school-based trials. So Asian American youth um, are primarily second generation. That means they are um, children of immigrants. And uh, what we know about the prevalence of mental health disorders among Asian Americans is that they, uh, the prevalence rates substantially increase among um, US born and then subsequent generations of, of um, Asian Americans. And compared to non-Hispanic white youth, Asian American young children, children and adolescents in uh, a number of studies appear to be at greater risk for the development of internalizing problems or depression and anxiety. But I will say that our community epidemiological data is, is not great, it's regional, um, and uh, they, they are not nationally representative samples. So this is data that we could really use more of. We know that there are big disparities in um, uh, mental health services for Asian American youth, and we're getting sort of better and better at ruling out explanations for why we see Asian American youth underrepresented in systems of care. So we know from the work of Ann Garland, um, one of my great mentors, that disparities in service use are not attributable to lower levels of mental health need, that is symptoms or functional impairment among Asian American youth compared to other racial ethnic minority groups. And um, it, it's not attributable to different levels of coverage for care or insurance or access issues. We know among Asian American um, families, rates of unmet mental health need um, are greatest among uh, households headed by immigrant parents relative to uh, US born um, parents. And this is important because it tells us something about the, the, uh, the role potentially of parents as gatekeepers for accessing care for their Asian American um, children. And we know also from uh, the work of another student and uh, I worked with in the past, uh, Dr. Cece Guo, um, that internalizing problems, depression, anxiety are particularly underserved among all ethnic minority youth compared to white youth, but particularly among Asian Americans. And this makes sense, right? Because we can talk about troubled uh, children who are quote unquote troubled versus troubling. It's those in, uh, uh, youngsters with internalizing problems that you know, don't create problems uh, for other people in like school settings or other settings that, that are the ones that are, whose needs are invisible and, and don't get treated. So we can start to think about um, explanations for these treatment disparities at multiple levels. Um, so at the service system level, um, the family or caregiver uh, contexts, and um, you, it, issues around youth um, and their kind of self-regulation processes or clinical presentations. And my work really has focused a lot lately on school-based mental health. Um, and, you know, we know that school-based mental health um, is now really the de facto uh, mental health system uh, for children uh, in the United States with most outpatient care happening in schools relative to specialty mental health settings. And school-based mental health services are, are great in that they really can reduce access barriers, providing care where children are um, so that they can reduce disparities. And, and that all is fantastic, but we also know that disparities persist in school-based mental health services. So they're all the, even though that they're reduced in schools versus clinics, we see pronounced disparities in unmet mental health need for uh, <clears throat> youth who are depressed um, and suicidal. Uh, and we know that Latinx and Asian American students are less likely to access mental, school mental health services than uh, youth from other racial uh, ethnic backgrounds. And of course, um, like we said already, internalizing mental health problems are the most likely to go undetected in schools, uh, particularly among ethnic minority students. And we actually have fairly good data now that conduct problems among ethnic minority students do receive a lot of attention and uh, <clears throat> mental health services. Um, and this may also be related to sort of disproportionate school discipline, unfortunately, for youth of color but it's really those um, uh, youngsters who present with internalizing mental health problems that go undetected. 
Um, so we have some kind of um, pretty extraordinary odds ratios from when we look at um, rates of mental health service use among Asian American students um, compared to other groups. Even though Asian American students have um, measured levels of mental health need, um, not significantly different from other racial ethnic groups in some of these in some of these systems, they are far less likely to be re, be referred for care by adult gapers, uh, gatekeepers in school mental health sim, sim, uh, uh, systems. So we published one study where there was an unadjusted odds ratio of uh, five times less likely. Um, and that uh, we had an extraordinary increase in um, this odds ratio when we adjusted for levels of mental health need. So in this school district, this was a, a system where Asian American youth actually uh, were reporting high levels of need and yet were far less likely to be referred. And when we adjusted for those levels of symptoms, we, we saw this extraordinary jump in the odds ratio. So what are some of the caregiver factors um, or parenting or family factors we think may underlie some of these treatment disparities? Um, <clears throat> well, uh, stigma, obviously mental health stigma is a big issue in all communities, non-Hispanic white communities as well. Um, but there is some evidence that a heritage cultural values um, related to family interdependence and face concern may shape mental health stigma related concern that particularly deter treatment seeking among Asian American families. Um, some family socialization practices uh, may be relevant here. So in um, cultural psychology literature, uh, we know that individuals with an interdependent self-construal um, tend to uh, have more favorable uh, or tend to socialize strategies to downregulate um, the open expression of intense emotion. Um, and so, you know, the encouragement of emotion suppression or expressive suppression in cultures um, where individuals are sort of trained to um, put the needs of the group above the needs of the self um, or to not draw attention to the self or burden others um, does relate to these socialization strategies. And we know that children, even as young as the preschool period, um, we see uh, racial ethnic differences in children's overt uh, display of emotion um, in the context of affect induction tasks in the laboratory, as well as in um, parent reports of um, youth expressivity. Um, so this might be relevant, right, to um, uh, why we don't uh, see children in services for emotional um, uh, distresses often in children from um, Asian American interdependent um, backgrounds. Mental health literacy may also be a factor. So um, difficulty recognizing internalizing symptoms um, may be a big issue, especially when Asian American parents are less acculturated and have lower levels of mental health literacy, um, identifying early signs and symptoms of internalizing problems like depression and anxiety. Uh, and in this Fung and Lao study, um, we saw that um, acculturation gaps or differences between um, Asian American parents and their um, uh, children was related to uh, more or greater discrepancies in ratings of internalizing symptoms between um, caregivers and children. Um, so that identification of problems um, may, be, may be a factor in low levels of mental health services. And then even when um, ch uh, childhood emotional or behavioral problems are noticed, um, different health beliefs about these emotional and behavioral problems may also lead to Asian American children not presenting for mental health care. So um, in this um, important study by May Ye and colleagues, um, Asian American parents were less likely to conceptualize uh, childhood emotional and behavior problems as being caused by um, biopsychosocial factors um, that are targeted in, me in mental health care. And this partially explained racial ethnic disparities in service utilization for emotional behavior problems among children um, in San Diego County. 
um, Asian American parents uh, were more likely to endorse more societal causes, things like um, uh, being too exposed to American culture or bad peers as uh, causing emotional behavior problems. And these are things that parents did not see as um, uh, things that could be addressed in mental health treatment and thus children um, uh, weren't, weren't uh, entering care. In terms of student factors, I've alluded to this a little bit already. So um, Asian American students are less likely to be referred for school-based mental health services. Um, and these lower rates of referral um, appeared explained by having fewer or lower levels of um, externalizing or conduct related problems. Um, more preservation of um, uh, adaptive functioning, particularly with regard to their school functioning, um, their GPA, um, and their um, bonding and school citizenship, school bonding and school citizenship. Um, and these um, sort of uh, differences were um, partially but not completely explaining racial ethnic differences and likelihood of referral to school-based mental health. So sort of clinical presentation of very Asian American students um, uh, leads to under detection of their mental health need and uh, less entry into care. And another um, kind of factor in the youth themselves is their health their help seeking behaviors. Um, so we do know that adult gatekeepers are really essential in getting kids into care, um, but also we know that youth themselves um, often disclose need um, in ways that are important um, to, to, for, for adults to know that they need help. So um, we definitely have some evidence that um, this, is, this is a sample of Vietnamese um, and a European American adolescents, a high school um, sample where we showed that the relationship between um, total mental health symptoms and the probability of help seeking, formal help seeking, um, you see this nice, sensible increase um, uh, relationship for European American students and no such relationship between symptoms and formal um, service seeking or help seeking among Vietnamese American youth, which, which is concerning. Um, we can see, do the same thing in terms of looking at family stress. So for European American adolescents, they have this sort of um, rational increase in formal help seeking as, as family stress increases. And we don't see that for Vietnamese American youth. Um, and also um, we can look at it by race ethnicity in this way. And we can also look at it uh, in terms of cultural values. And what's happening here is that for youth who um, strongly endorse values of family obligation we, um, we see no relationship uh, uh, between um, family stress and help seeking, but for youth who have low levels of family obligation, or maybe we can infer are more, um, uh, have an independent uh, self-construal, uh, those individuals are the ones where we see an increase in formal help seeking with, um, as family stress increases. Um, we have some recent data showing very similar findings of moderation between the relationship between um, um, internalizing symptoms and um, help seeking uh, as a function of mental health stigma. So mental health stigma is also something that really um, depresses this, what should be this rational relationship between symptoms and help seeking for Asian American students. So um, lots of disparities to be worried about. Um, how can we start to counter some of these disparities and get kid, uh, care to Asian American students who do have need? Um, we've looked at um, universal screening efforts in schools. Um, can we identify um, youth with uh, brief routine screen, screening and provide them with care? Um, can we install evidence-based preventive interventions in schools and establish their effectiveness for Asian American students? And how can we think about when we offer evidence-based uh, interventions? Um, how can we encourage engagement in them 
through um, prevention, health promotion, and wellness branding, and to and in terms of trying to understand the preferences of Asian American youth um, for mental health care. So um, we we did a randomized um, cluster randomized trial looking to see if universal screening could reduce rates of disparities um, in school mental health referrals and care for Asian American students. And this um, work is actually conducted um, in a district uh, called the Al Alhambra Unified School District um, that's just outside Los Angeles. And this is a district that is majority Asian American and um, Latinx. Um, and we randomized schools in this district to um, uh, a brief routine um, depression screening uh, versus no screening um, to see if we could increase rates of referral. And of, of course, um, uh, it makes sense that we were able to uh, increase referrals um, uh, in the schools where we had screening happening um, and they were increased both for Asian American and Latinx youth. Um, so this was sort of our design, um, but I will cut to the chase with the bad news. Um, even though we were able to increase rates of, um, even though screening was um, able to increase rates of referral, um, we did not impact disparities in the utilization of care. So we, we, we still observed racial disparities in the utilization of care um, between Asian American and Latinx youth. And this was primarily because referrals to care that were triggered by routine screening were not as effective in ultimately linking children to services than were routine referrals by school personnel. So um, caregivers were less likely to um, consent to care for their youth when need was identified through routine screening. So this really pointed to the need to, you know, do much more after you identify need um, to, to encourage that engagement. And this, you'll see engagement will continue to be an, uh, an important theme um, in the rest of um, the talk today. I'd like to shift a little bit to a, a, an, an even more um, a critical and urgent um, mental health need, um, thinking about um, our most vulnerable Asian American students who, um, who may be at risk for um, suicidal behavior um, or completed suicide. Um, we've probably all read a lot about um, um, Asian American students, high performing Asian American students facing a lot of academic pressure um, and what was investigated as a possible cluster of adolescent suicides in Northern California a couple years ago. Um, this is definitely um, a big concern. And here are data from the CDC um, from 2019, the high school youth risk survey, um, where we can see rates of um, death by suicide, whoops, death by suicide, um, suicidal ideation among high schoolers. Um, and we can, we can definitely see um, uh, some, some areas of concern uh, in different um, uh, odds ratios here. Uh, in particular here, suicidal ideation for Asian American um, adolescent boys um, compared to non-Hispanic white boys. Um, and attempts here, 20% increase for girls um, in attempts. So this is something that um, colleagues, um, I've been working with colleagues a lot on and the kind of um, research and clinical work um, that kind of uh, makes us lose sleep at night, um, trying to figure out how to um, improve our systems of care um, for youth at risk of suicide. Um, and we, again, in collaboration with um, first Alhambra Unified School District and, and more recently with multiple other school districts have been thinking about what does our risk assessment um, look like in schools um, as a matter of routine. And schools um, 
these days, I think are doing a much better job of having systems in place for assessing risk and um, crisis intervention. Um, so the zero suicide model recommendations are really to think through in school systems, uh, what are the processes for assessing and detecting suicide risk, and then intervening and providing acute care and um, ensuring uh, referral to continuity of care and ongoing linkage to care um, that starts in schools. There isn't great national data on how often youth are being identified as being at risk of um, suicide in schools, but I can tell you it's the front lines and, and we need that data. Um, we've only been doing uh, this work in a sort of um, uh, districts where there is a mental health safety, mental health uh, safety net in place. Um, so it's probably not representative of what's happening around the country. Um, but even in, in, in places where the infrastructure is in place, we're seeing some real quality problems um, and concerns. So these are data again, um, uh, from um, Alhambra Unified School District. It's been a great partner in research um, over the years. And this is what um, mental health service utilization looked like after an initial suicide risk assessment in the district across five years. So um, across those five years, 740 students were identified as having some potential suicide risk these um, you know, are sort of uh, routine detection where you know, a peer might disclose to a school person, a personnel that a friend said something that made them worried um, or a teacher um, may have um, heard directly from a student um, something that made them concerned about risk and the like. So 740 students in the district um, uh, included 307 Asian American students, 348 um, Latinx students, and 82 assessments of youth from other uh, racial ethnic groups. And what we um, looked at was um, uh, for these um, youth who went through a risk assessment, we, we were able to um, uh, find data on their mental health service utilization in the service use um, information system uh, that the, the school district had in place. And so for those students assessed, um, we were able to uh, determine over the um, ensuing months um, who, how many of those students went on to get mental health care after being identified as at risk of um, suicidal behavior. And we can see these rates, 43.5% of Asian American students, 57.1% of Latinx students, um, and 44% of the other racial ethnic uh, groups. So none of us should be particularly happy about these numbers, but I will say that they're actually higher than in other regional studies, um, uh, but the data are, remain fairly limited. And there was a significant racial ethnic difference between Asian American and Latinx um, youth in this probability of continuity of care afterward. And we did some uh, qualitative research to try to understand uh, what was happening with these gaps in care and losing um, children to follow up. Um, so we interviewed students and parents who had had a prior experience with suicide, uh, school-based suicide risk assessment in the district, as well as school staff, um, administrators, teachers, and counselors who were involved in the, uh, um, conducting the risk assessments at schools um, to try to understand what was happening. And we heard uh, from many students and uh, their parents that, um, you know, the, the process of being assessed for suicide risk it, at school um, was, uh, was a really stressful and sometimes traumatic one. Um, so what typically happens is um, the student is brought into a counselor or administrator's office and uh, the emphasis is really on assessing that youth's safety. Um, so things happen like locker and bag searches. Um, some protocols are that you need to put latex gloves on uh, before searching some a kid's backpack. Um, 
a number of people come, some schools, some school districts have redundancy. So um, two people carry out the risk assessment and ask some of the same risk assessment questions more than once. Um, it's perceived as rigid. Um, it feels to the youth like a disciplinary encounter, like they're in trouble oftentimes. Um, their parents are called into the school. Um, sometimes there's a long wait, uh, you know, obviously for working parents to get there. Um, and uh, parents feel excluded, parents and youth felt, feel excluded from decision-making. Um, and uh, there's often a need to um, arrange emergency transport um, and uh, which can end up in an ER visit or um, psychiatric hospitalization that of course can be involuntary. Um, and of course, all of um, this flows from a, you know, a system of triage and risk assessment um, that is meant to keep the adolescent safe. Um, but um, there's definitely some stigmatizing uh, and traumatic aspects of this. So uh, many schools, um, you know, use psychiatric mobile response teams um, or ambulance transport. Um, some school districts uh, provide transport by school resource officers in patrol cars uh, where youth are handcuffed and put into the back of a police car uh, and transported that way. Um, and these are the systems that we have in place. Uh, for Asian American students and other students from other groups, this is often their first encounter with a mental health service. Um, and so that's another, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty shocking uh, entry into mental health uh, care. Um, in terms of the school staff and administrators, to a person, these are people who are very dedicated, um, very, very empathic and want to put student welfare first. They feel comforted by having a, a routinized standardized procedure for assessing risk. Although they really want to reduce negative student experiences, they really feel um, that their, their number one job is to keep the adolescents safe. Um, they, there's often a very the few mental health providers available, if any, on school sites to carry out this work. So we're often talking about, you know, folks who don't have particular mental health training um, or resources um, to, to do sort of a therapeutic assessment. So um, we cl clearly have a need for evidence-based, culturally responsive, trauma-informed um, ways of, of, of meeting um, youth's needs in, in this particular type of situation. So um, with our preliminary data, um, we, uh, we, we proposed to the NIH to study um, safety A as a, as a, um, a care strategy for a, um, therapeutic assessment and initial crisis intervention for youth identified with suicide risk. This is an intervention developed by Jonas Sarno at UCLA in psychiatry. And she first developed this intervention um, and designed it and implemented in um, emergency rooms where adolescents were pre presenting uh, with suicidal behavior. Um, it's a uh, cognitive behavioral and family systems informed intervention. It is one in-person encounter with uh, telephone-based uh, follow-ups. And um, it, 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 um, it involves caregivers throughout the therapeutic assessment and the, the single session intervention. And um, it has been shown to be effective in enhancing rates of linkage to outpatient mental health care following an ED visit or hospitalization. And um, we've proposed to adapt this model for use in schools. This is a very extremely busy slide, but what I'll just say is that we're really um, grateful to have um, just um, had the NIH Council approve this R34 to adapt this intervention for schools. And we're adapting it for the implementation context of schools um, to fit with district policies, the mental health workforce um, that's there. Um, as well as adapting the clinical intervention to um, 
address what we believe are the mechanisms that underlie racial disparities in continuity of care for Asian American and Latinx um, youth who have been assessed with suicidal uh, behavior at schools. So we are going to be adapting the intervention to make sure that we target the mechanisms of stigma, reducing stigma, reducing mistrust, and um, reducing the concealment of youth distress. And by this, we mean that oftentimes that, that encounter at schools that feels very coercive, what youth and families walk away uh, as, with as a lesson is, okay, so don't tell anybody how you're feeling at school because this is what happens. So um, we are going to be adapting the intervention to really um, make sure that we um, we pay close attention to these um, potential mechanisms that might drive disparities. Okay, um, I see that time is running short. <laughs> so I am going to uh, talk a little bit about effectiveness tests of interventions that we've done um, with Asian American students in schools. And I'll just be going pretty quickly, unfortunately, here. Um, these are just data showing that there have been, there's been very, very little representation of Asian Americans um, in randomized control trials uh, for treatments uh, for depression. Um, and this has effectively not changed since the early 1980s. Um, and um, kind of makes sense in that only 0.17% of the NIH budget has been devoted to Asian American Pacific Islander clinical research. And this has not changed uh, pre and post the year 2000. So this is really, really important work. Um, how can we begin to translate them, the observational research that we have into the development and testing of evidence-based interventions that work for Asian American um, youth? Um, we have uh, been sort of uh, focused on uh, trying to select evidence-based interventions that might fit for um, the needs of Asian American youth. Um, so um, we've done research on interpersonal stress that seems to be shaped by immigrant family process in Asian American and Pacific Islander families. So these are things like acculturation gaps between caregivers and youth that generate um, either estrangement or conflict um, that, that increased risk of internalizing problems. Um, we've already talked about how internalizing problems are elevated among Asian American um, youth and adolescents. And um, another um, uh, risk factor that we've looked at is reliance on emotion suppression coping among Asian American young people, um, which does seem to relate to increased um, rates of internalizing symptoms. Um, prospectively. Um, so we have been really thinking about what are the key intervention targets for Asian American youth in schools and selecting interventions on that basis. So we have evaluated school-based uh, preventive interventions to reduce the risk of internalizing problems. Um, some interventions we've selected to increase, um, uh, to, to decrease levels of interpersonal uh, distress and increase skills in managing relationships, as well as interventions to increase positive emotion regulation strategies and decrease reliance on emotion suppression coping. So I will say that we've done trials of mindfulness interventions um, with samples of primarily Latinx and Asian American youth. And I will just tell you that they are effective <laughs> and that effect size is actually even um, uh, larger than the developer published trials of these interventions. I think I hear someone unmuting and I see a question in the chat. Um, 
the hypothesized target for the R34 and um, measuring in target engagement. Um, I think that this, this relates to the, the question about the suicide prevention strategies and the safety A intervention. So um, the outcome that we're looking to uh, improve is rates of continuity of care engagement in outpatient treatment following a school-based suicide risk assessment. Um, this, is, this is an engage, primarily an engagement intervention. Um, our primary outcomes are not symptom, but they symptom reduction of symptoms, but they are engagement and care. That answers your question, Tony. Um, okay, so going back to the mindfulness interventions, um, we do see clinically important reductions both in internalizing problems and externalizing problems in these trials that are not rate moderated by race, ethnicity, or acculturation level. Um, the outcomes for internalizing problems are uh, appear to be mediated by reductions in emotion suppression coping and rumination. Um, and we also have looked at interpersonally focused interventions. And we actually did a preference trial here where we, you know, we've been interested in the problem of engaging um, adolescents in care and wanted to know if offering um, a choice of interventions. And in this case, we're offering a mindfulness-based intervention sort of secondary control or adjusting the self in response to stressors uh, versus an interpersonal skills focused intervention. In this case, it was interpersonal therapy for adolescents. Um, the, um, the, it's IPT-AST, the Adolescent Skills Training version, which is a school-based preventive uh, version of IPT. And in a preference design, what you do is you randomize the adolescents first to receive a randomly assigned intervention, or you randomize them to receive their preferred intervention. Um, and so in this type of design, we are interested in the effects of um, kids getting a preferred intervention. Um, and of course, the effects of what treatment condition they got. And we were looking at the outcomes of anxiety, depression symptoms, as well as engagement and looking at uh, the possible mechanisms of change. So again, emotion suppression, uh, reductions in interpersonal uh, stress and increases in uh, social support. And what did we find? Well, we actually did not find any effects of offering a choice of EVPs or a youth receiving their preferred versus non-preferred intervention, which was somewhat surprising to us. We did find that adolescents who at, at the start said that they preferred a mindfulness approach, those youth tended to do better overall. We're not exactly sure why that is. We found that matching kids are in our analysis where we um, looked at moderation, where we sort of uh, look to see if um, youth say high on interpersonal stress benefited more from IPT. So risk profile indications. Uh, predicted outcomes, and we did not find any evidence for matching. Um, but we did find a quite a strong uh, program effect where mindfulness outperformed um, the interpersonal intervention uh, for our um, sample, which was primarily um, Latinx. Uh, I'm sorry, Asian American, Latinx, uh, and some white and and non-Hispanic white youth. Um, so. Teen Talk is the IPT intervention and L2B is the mindfulness intervention. We really had superiority both in terms of anxiety outcomes and depression outcomes. Um, interestingly, uh, we, we found that both interventions um, really helped improve um, or decrease reliance on emotion suppression coping. Um, we actually found that on our interpersonal functioning outcomes, the mindfulness intervention was, was more effective in improving interpersonal functioning. Um, actually, so that was a surprise to us. So um, what we took away here was that um, 
you know, I guess it's sort of good in that um, youth improved in the more scalable, mostly in the more scalable mindfulness intervention. Um, there was no evidence of the need to match kids to the EBI that um, uh, best match their baseline profile. And yeah, and the mindfulness intervention had much stronger improvements and it was much more scalable and um, it is designed for non-mental health specialists to deliver. So that's all really great. Whereas the IPT model is a, a much more kind of training heavy model that includes both group sessions and individual sessions. So um, we did some qualitative and mixed methods research to try to sort of understand maybe why didn't why did we not achieve the same outcomes in our interpersonal intervention uh, as compared to some of the prior trials on this school-based preventive intervention. Um, and so we did some intensive coding of um, session transcripts from our IPTAST groups. Um, and we contrasted the groups that had more Asian American um, immigrant family youth with the groups that um, um, had um, less Asian American and immigrant family youth um, representation in them. And we found um, some themes emerging that the adolescents in these groups were talking more about that they're used to relying on emotion suppression coping, um, that some of the contexts of their stress were around academic achievement mode, um, expectations, uh, a lot more discussion of value discrepancies and their relationships, both with their parents and their peers, and um, more mentions of feeling uncomfortable trying some of these new interpersonal strategies that required assertion and open expression of feelings um, that took them a little longer to warm up to these skills. So it could be that the mindfulness intervention, which is secondary control coping, adjusting the self, still working on emotion regulation strategies, but ones that didn't require changes in the structure and approach to relationships. Um, so it could have been a cultural fit issue um, for our Asian American youth. So I'm gonna just wrap up here, um, just to remind us all from the beginning that Asian, youth, Asian American youth do indeed have significant mental health needs, particularly around uh, depression, anxiety, um, and some evidence of increased need with regard to suicidal behavior um, and thoughts. Um, engagement and care for these problems remains a critical challenge, both in terms of um, recognition by gatekeepers as well as um, individual barriers to, to help seeking among youth themselves. When access to evidence-based care is provided, treatments appear to be effective and particularly we're excited about the, um, the, 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 the large and potent and scalable effects of the mindfulness-based interventions that we've um, trialed in school contexts. Um, and uh, we think that the more interpersonally skills focused interventions may require close attention to culturally responsive delivery um, with Asian American uh, youngsters and families. Um, and when we deploy these preventive uh, interventions in school settings, uh, we really need to think very carefully about culturally responsive engagement strategies. Um, and so we're really, um, doubling down and focusing hard on um, scalable intervention strategies, particularly for youth who we are concerned about uh, risk of suicide. So I will stop there and just give thanks to um, uh, many colleagues who have assisted um, and contributed to this work. Thank you so much, Dr. Lau. I wanna open up um, the space for anyone who has questions. Um, you can go ahead and type them in the chat or unmute yourself. Did the, so Tony Yang, um, did the mindfulness intervention help reduce suicidal ideation? That's a great question. Um, we did not in the in the prevention trials. Uh, we did not uh, assess suicidal ideation was not a part. We used the mood and feelings questionnaire, um, and we may even have taken out the suicide items. Um, 
this is a, this was a, um, these were not clinically depressed adolescents, but these were adolescents that had elevated, um, um, depression, anxiety symptoms. And of course, anytime we do this work in schools, um, it becomes a real challenge when we identify, when we screen and identify youth who may have um, suicidal ideation, which the base rates are very, very high. So we've thought very carefully about our outcome measures and whether we have the capacity to respond to every child um, that expresses um, ideation or passive ideation. So um, I can't tell you about that because in that prevention trial, we didn't assess it, but great question. If I could out the question. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Amanda, is that you? Hi. Yeah. Yep. I'm here. Hi, Amanda. Happy to Hi, see you. Hi, Anna. Here. Good to see you. Such a wonderful talk. Um, I had a quick question. So, um, you know, it's very much known that Asian Americans as a whole, the population is not um, accessing care at the rates that we would want them to. I wonder if you could speak for a minute or two about the variability within the Asian American community in terms of specific ethnicities and cultures and what um, differences in rates might look like. Hmm. Yeah, I don't think we have great data on that, um, but um, I do. we do have data showing that as far as youth are concerned, it's youth with immigrant parents who are, um, so at, a greater risk of unmet mental health need. So that does um, extending that a little bit further in terms of um, you know, ethnic differences, I would imagine that the more, you know, the more the newer immigrant groups, um, I would imagine that rates of underutilization are even lower. I will say though that there is a um, a potential uh, one, one piece of community epidemiological data that I think is really notable is um, uh, there was a psychiatric epidemiological study among Cambodian Americans in Long Beach. And um, this was a study where um, uh, rates of PTSD, this is among adults, rates of PTSD and depression were extraordinarily high in this sample of um, a refugee community. This is 25 years on average after resettlement. Rates of um, uh, disorder were really high and rates of service use were higher than in other um, in other um, API groups and prior studies uh, in prior national epidemiologic studies. So I think your point is really well taken. We really need disaggregated data um, and uh, to, sort of, to, to sort of know uh, where we need to do the most work in terms of um, unmet need, um, but it's pretty low all around, <laughs> um, particularly for immigrant communities. We have uh, another question in the chat. Um, among Asian American youth, do you find any preferences for different mental health care delivery systems, group-based, individual, online treatment, for example? Mm, that's a really such a great question. Um, so when, when we were doing some of our school-based work, we asked youth uh, and stakeholders about preferences and um, adolescents did they were very interested in group-based um, preventive interventions. I think that's sort of normalizing and um, helpful and potentially less stigmatizing. Um, and the other thing that Allison's were really clear on, which, you know, you know, we can ask ourselves whether this was the right way to go, but they were really didn't want family-based treatment. Um, so when we asked about, uh, when we were um, kind of going from our translational findings, that were really a lot about um, acculturation related conflict in families and interpersonal stress in families, it was very natural question for us to ask about more family-based um, interventions and youth were very clearly not interested in that, at least in the schools that we were partnering with. So that's a great question. As far as online interventions, um, 
you know, that's not something that we've tried very much, but, um, in, in our work with adolescents, but I do know from our, you know, the work at UCLA and, um, the work of the depression grand challenge, which is this sort of, um, stepped care model, right. Where, um, there's universal, universally accessible screening and then, um, uh, basically a step care model with the lowest level of care being um, uh, basically an ICBT approach. Um, I think that what we're seeing is that um, rates of uptake are very, very low among people who have needs. So um, a student of mine is doing a dissertation now. It looks like rates are about 8% of students with identified need who um, are, are eligible for that tier of care, take it up. So I don't think the online interventions by themselves are gonna be a panacea uh, for this. Um, uh, and we, again, really need to think about engagement. Thank you, Dr. Lau. Thank you everyone for your time today, um, especially you, Dr. Lau, such an informative talk rich information. Um, really appreciate your time. And I'm so glad that you were able to make it today. Thank um, you take, so much for the invitation. Yeah. It was great to, great to be here. It was a privilege. Um, good day, everyone. Please be well, stay healthy.